Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode 261 of the Spearhead Sundays podcast and cafes, you're on notice, okay? I'm sick of it. I'm sick of the strange coffee cup sizes. I'm sick of the weird meals. I'm sick of you giving me one egg and then charging me extra to have two. The meals should always come with two as standard. Charge me extra for three. Don't charge me for two eggs. Close your fucking cafe. It sucks. All right, you're on notice. I'm announcing officially the opening of a brand new cafe shaming chat in the Patreon only Discord. If you see cafes acting mischievous, if you see cafes having sizes like small, medium, big boy, I want you to put it in that fucking chat and I'm going to be shaming cafes every single week on this show because I've had enough of it, okay? My local cafe does small and then large. And the large isn't a large, it's a small. And I'm upset about it. I'm sick of it. And it's time to end. All right? This thing is cheap. Add a third. Why would you have two sizes? Add three. Every fucking place should have three sizes and it should be small, medium, large. If you have a fourth one, you can give it a crazy name. I'll allow it. But until then... All right, you're on notice. Cafes are on notice. Join the Patreon Discord. Not only do you get an extra episode every single week of the Spearhead Sundays podcast that's exclusive to Patreon supporters, you'll also be helping change the world. You'll make you'll be making a, a true, real difference, and that difference is shaming small businesses. Something that I feel very passionate about. If you see a small business run a mum and pop store, all right, let's see let's see if we can hurt him. Okay, you know. Let's see, let's see if we can apply some, some Spearhead Sunday sanctions. That's what I'm talking about. All right? No fly zone? Isn't that what they call your wardrobe? Nice little joke there about uh, current events. And a great diss uh, for your friend. If he, ev- if he ever talks about a no fly, if your friend ever talks about a no fly zone, you go, oh, did you hear that? They want, it. They want to bring like a no fly zone. You go, no fly zone. Isn't that what they call your wardrobe? Nice little burn. And that's a, that's a free gift from me to you. And that's worth supporting me on Patreon, guys. Run it up now. I command it. Let's get Keelan paid, all right? Yeah. I paid him today in, in, in two packets of tiny teddies. One packet. One packet. You didn't eat the second one? No, Zach didn't give it to me in the end. Oh, well, you know what? You know what? Support me on Patreon, and we'll and we'll give him a second packet of tiny teddies, and and then we'll consider paying him because right now Keelan's here as a, as a bit of a hobby. It's a leisure activity for him. Um, but you know that's that's also been my life. Great. So look, Luke Kidgel has COVID. I'm happy about it. I I think it's great. I think it's a good move. Um, I and and I and I really feel vindicated. I think that uh, I reckon that I'm going to go the longest in the country without getting COVID. I don't think I'm going to get it. For a very long time, I don't leave the house, right? I don't, I don't see friends. I don't go out. I don't go to movies. I sit in my house and I and I go to cafes and then I trash them on a podcast that gets thousands of listens. All right, that's my life. So unless those small businesses want to like blow COVID at me, right? But sucked in, they have to wear masks. I don't take that hospitality staff. Boom, gotcha. You know, I heard uh, that uh, from from a family friend, a nurse, uh, the the policy at their hospital, um, and this is true because my mum told it to me, um, uh, they don't, if they test positive with COVID, they can still go to work as long as they wear an N95 mask. That's And that's that's the type of hellscape that I want to live in. That's what I want to see more of is, is I, I think that's really great. And I think that really, again, makes me feel real happy that they locked us up for two fucking years just to send nurses with COVID into work. Great. I'm glad I cancelled two years of touring and lived in fucking Tasmania just so we could all get to the end of it and go, oh, well, guess we better send the COVID positive nurse into the cancer ward. Good luck, Grandpa. Thanks, guys. That's great. Feel really good about it. I reckon maybe in 100 episodes I might stop bitching about COVID. Um... But anyway, look, I, uh, I'm famous. I've made it. I'm, uh, I'm the most famous person in the country right now. I know, uh, you, you know things have changed. You guys have noticed. Uh, it's not your small little uh, indie, you know, comedian that you're supporting anymore, is it? You know? It's your, it's your big, famous, too-good-for-you, massive superstar arena-filling act. 
And the reason for that is, right, I was on SBS at 8.30 p.m. once, unpaid. All right? Unpaid. Didn't pay me for it. Not, not upset about it at all. Took an entire day out of my life and Rosie's life. Flew all the way to Sydney. Unpaid appearance. Not mad about it at all. Doesn't matter. Hey, yep, sure, I'll give you free labor. Who am I? Fucking Keelan? <laughs> hey. Hey, man, what's up? <laughs> Look, all I'm saying is it would have been nice to get two bucks from SBS. I know their budget is like $10 an episode, but, you know, no, don't worry, guys. I, uh, I got every penny I could out of SBS. They said, oh, we need to fly you up for the episode. And they, they paid for the travel. And I was like, all right, sweet. Didn't tell them that I lived in Frankston. Gee, that was a that was a glorious hundred and eighty dollar taxi ride paid for by the government. <laughs> thank you very much. If anyone if anyone out there pays tax who listen to this, hey, thanks so much for the hundred and eighty dollar taxi ride. Both ways, three hundred and sixty dollars straight out of your pocket. Thank you so much, taxpayers. That was good. What else did I get? I got uh, I got I got flights. Qantas, baby. That's right. I got a quant. I got a Qantas flight. Now, mind you, the tickets to those to uh, from Melbourne to Sydney on Qantas is probably cheaper than a taxi ride from Frankston to the airport. But thanks so much to the taxpayer for that. Not only right did I get that, I also when they reached out to me to organise travel, when I talked to the producer, right, he all of the conversations were around flying me up. Lewis, we're going to fly you up. We're going to fly you to Sydney. We're going to put you up in a hotel. You are going to be the only person traveling. And I said, yep, that's sweet. And then when the woman hit me up to book flights, (laughs) I went, yep. She goes, I'm going to need your name and your date of birth. And I responded, no worries. Here's my name and here's Rosie's name and our date of birth. And I didn't say, can I bring? I didn't say I would like to bring. I didn't say it would be nice if you could also. I said, here's my name. Here's Rosie's name. Bing, bang, two hotel rooms, (laughs) return flights, Qantas, taxi all the way there and back for two people. We get to the hotel. They've only booked one room because they're assuming that we were uh, a double act. And I said, hey, Absolutely not. I want two rooms. And I got two rooms, two separate rooms in a nice hotel. And then I get a call from the producer going, oh, I think there's been a little bit of a mix up. I think whoever booked your flights assumed that you guys were like a double act. And I went, oh, really? I don't know how they got that impression. Oh, man, I I thought it was really clear. I thought I said that that Rosie was my co-worker and she was just there to help me film a video about it. And they were like, oh, it must have been a mix-up, no worries. Hey, sucked in, SBS. The scam king strikes again. <laughs> Shout out to the taxpayer. That was a good, uh, I reckon, good, like, $1,000 we got out of, out of your wallet. So thank you very much. Uh, that's my real mission in life, is, is and, I, and I highly encourage it. If you're ever approached by a big business, take everything you can. Empty their pockets, all right? Every, it, here's what you should be doing. You should be saying, when you go to a small business, you say, keep the change. You interact with a big business, you you take everything you can get. Because I'm pretty sure that SBS uh, is even worse than a company like Amazon, right? Like so much worse than a company like Apple, right? Way worse than a company like Shell Oil, you know? Because those three evil corporations, they don't pay tax. But at least they don't cost tax, huh? Huh? SBS cost the taxpayer. No, it was a great experience. <laughs> it was a great experience, and I'm very grateful for it. You know, as, as a straight white male, they don't have very many of, of us on SBS, the multicultural broadcaster. So it was really good to jump on SBS uh, Insight, and they, and they put me in the front row with another straight white woman. That's really great. You know, diverse, but we're not stupid. <laughs> that, <laughs> that seems to be the little mission statement there at SBS. No, it was fun. I'd never, I'd never done anything uh, like that before. That was, it was cool, man. It was, you know, what was really cool about it was, uh, was it was, I was approached as a comedian. You know, like the only you guys know me, the only times I'm ever on any form of media, radio or otherwise, radio, TV or whatever in in papers, it's like I'm either tricking them and pretending to be someone that I'm not to get a fake story on or they're writing a hit piece or they're talking like about, oh, YouTuber this or TikTok or that. It was really cool. Like that was my first kind of 
actual real TV experience where they were like, hey, we, you're a comedian. We want to talk to comedians who've had, you know, experience with real controversies. And, and they took me seriously as an expert in the field. So they were fucking great. I, I don't have anything bad to say about SBS. And, and you know what? It makes me feel bad about rewarding them for so much money out of so many flights and stuff and, and, and taxis. That's a lie. I don't feel bad at all. In fact, I still think it's funny. I, I, I really like the idea of, of like, you know, when the, the, the liberal government, you know, when they start auditing all the government funded broadcasters, when they start doing that, I really hope that they go, see here that you've spent uh, $1,500 on getting one guy to do one episode of a show. What's going on there? And then they'll go, yeah, look, he, he robbed us. <laughs> and then they'll give me a call and I'll go, I'm sorry, was I paid for my appearance? And they'll say no. And then we'll call it even. All right. That's my ideal scenario. Okay. Because, you know, it all goes back to that. If you're not getting paid, guess what? I'm going to raid your wallet. I, my favorite thing about it was was uh, because they they only booked like one hotel room under Rosie's name. The hotel must have some exclusive deal with SBS and they thought that she was a TV star. So she got all of these gifts, like personalized gifts. She got like this beautiful diary with her name on it. And it was like, thank you so much, Rosie, for choosing to stay at our fancy wanky hotel. And they gave her like a bunch of free shit and I didn't get any of it. I didn't get any of that, right? So I took it all off her and I scribbled her name out <laughs> and I wrote Lewis. And put it in a sticker. And now it's oh, mine. That's awesome. Yep. And uh, and I don't use it, but it's it's about it, it's about the principle. That's not the point, okay? <laughs> if they, if anyone's getting free shit, it's me. Um, <laughs> so look, that's what's happening with me. I did the SBS thing and it was fun. I I think I came across well. Other than the Julius Caesar, Mark Zuckerberg hybrid haircut, I think I came across well. Uh, I'm upset that they did cut some of my jokes because I was I was there. You know, they I knew what they were going to ask me. Everyone knew what questions they were going to be asked, which makes it a little bit fake, I suppose, or makes everyone sound a lot smarter than they actually are, which I suppose is the point. Bye, everyone. Everyone's leaving. Bye. See you later. Yeah. Um. So. I did that, and I think I came across well, and I was pretty happy with how it was edited because the whole experience was, like, profoundly positive, and then I was sitting there for weeks, like, panicking that they would edit me to sound like an idiot, which I have happened done, have have had happened to me before multiple times where I've, like, even when I send in an email with comment, uh, sometimes they remove paragraphs or change wording and they make me sound stupid, uh, or, or other times I've done TV and they edit me to sound like a, a, an idiot or sound really mean or, or whatever. There's been a few times where I've done interviews or engaged with media and they've edited me really badly and I've been very upset with it. But even the way I was edited was great. Uh, and they did edit everyone down because we recorded for like two hours, but then the program was about 50 minutes. So everyone kind of had 50% of what they had to say removed from it. Um, and uh, yeah, it was good. It was kind of weird though, sitting there with a bunch of comedians and having some comedians be like quite pro cancel culture. To me, that seems like a painter going, yeah, I just, I, I love my job, but fuck, I hate brushes. <laughs> I really, like, I really think, I really think that we should use less brushes. You know, it's, I feel like you're just making your job so much harder. And also, like, uh, it's like, to me, it's like if if you're like pro cancel culture or or celebrating when other comedians get in a lot of trouble, I just feel like, oh yeah, they're gonna like, they're gonna come for you next. Like, it, it doesn't, it doesn't the the mob doesn't give a fuck about how many people you have also celebrated, you know, the the death of or the ruination of. You know, it's like it's like during the witch hunts. Just because you were there in the crowd watching the witch burn didn't mean that you were exempt from being burnt at the stake yourself. In fact, often it was the people that were like there or too excited about it. They go, this is a little bit suspicious. What's going on here? And that shit happens all the time where you see like, some comedian or some actor or some like uh, entertainer will like jump on and join in on the pile on and then everyone else will go hang on who's this bitch who's this cunt and they'll go through their fucking twitter history or their joke history and pull something out and go hey 
What about you? You said this. That happens all the time. No one's perfect. So I feel like whenever comics are happy when at, at the destruction of other comics, it seems weird and short-sighted and uh, sad to me. But... But whatever, for the most part, it was it was a great experience, and I think I came across well. Um, the guy, uh, if you if you watched it, uh, it's on the SBS On Demand app. You can watch the full thing. You cracking open another tiny teddy packet? Yeah. Did you did you ask? Uh, am I getting paid? No. I'm just I'm stealing from you like you stole from SBS. Yeah, that's right. Good. <laughs> and you know what? Can't can't complain about it. That's good. <laughs> that's great. Join the Patreon, please. I, I'm running out of teddies. Um, <laughs> Hey, man, if you keep doing a good job, we'll upgrade you to medium teddies. <laughs> that sucked. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, what was I saying? Uh, fucking, I can't even remember. Oh, yeah, the the guy, the first guy who performed stand-up. So I thought I had a pretty difficult job at the start because they were going to play, they played the Prince Philip bit and then they were going to ask me about it and I was thinking that maybe they would gotcha me or or they would ask or, or other comedians would jump in and, and say that it was offensive or whatever. So I was a little bit nervous about that. But I didn't have the hardest job. The hardest job was a guy called Rudy, great comic, uh, gay guy covered in tattoos, um, who's from like a real rough background and he has a pretty dark, you know, past and he talks about that on stage. So we've got very, very dark humour. He actually performed five minutes of material at the start and how it was set up was there were on, on the left side, there were like 10 comedians in chairs. On the right side, there were 10 people from different walks of life. So like they had like an old white guy, they had a, a gay woman, they had a brown chick, they had an Asian guy, they had uh, uh, just everyone, right? And he had to perform stand-up to them. And those people were told that they would be quizzed about each one of his jokes after. And they were also told that he'd be doing some dark material and they wanted to get their, their people's like thoughts on it. So that's like, that's like the most impossible fucking gig when you have to perform in front of people who know they're being filmed, know that they're part of the TV show, know that they're going to be asked about each joke so they so they're not really paying attention to the joke they're thinking about what they should say if they were asked about the particular joke and the worst one is they were told that all of the jokes were really edgy and dark and offensive which just scares people into thinking oh fuck this guy's going to say something crazy racist and if i laugh at it i'm going to get in trouble cuz they're going to ask me about it so i need to maybe i shouldn't laugh and and it just made them like completely lock up and he just did jokes and uh, so many of them fell to silence and they were hilarious jokes they were really really funny he's a great comic and he i actually saw him perform at an actual gig after and he did the same jokes and he crushed but it was just like an impossible job so we had to do his whole five minutes and then he had to do the five minutes again one joke at a time and they would pause and ask people what do you think about this and what do you think about that and uh I actually, th I actually thought that that if I were him, I'd be a little bit upset at how I was edited because, in, on the night, they asked each person like, "Oh, what did you think about this joke?" and 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 some of them really didn't like them, and they would say, oh, "I really didn't like this." And then for each person, he would go back at them like, so one woman, he told a joke about domestic violence, uh, and that like because he grew up with it in his family, and then uh, this white woman goes, "Oh." I really didn't like this joke about domestic violence, blah, blah, blah. And he had like a great clap back of like, oh, great. So the woman who didn't grow up in that environment wants me to not talk about my own life and my own experiences. Great. And they removed that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Really good. And he had some like great responses to all of them. So great comic. Shout out to uh, Rudy. Real cool guy. I'd never met him before either. Did you get to talk to all the comedians afterwards? Yeah, I got to t I got to talk to, to Jordan Raskopoulos, um, who I suppose was, I suppose me and her were maybe the people that disagree with each other the most, I guess. Uh, cause she was kind of like pro, uh, like consequences for, for jokes, I guess. And, and pro, uh, people, you know, yelling at comics. So I think she was like kind of pro that. Um, but she was lovely afterwards. Uh, and I was a, I was a big fan of uh, the axis of awesome stuff that they did. Like, uh, pre-transition and many years ago. So that was kind of cool to meet them. Uh, I mean, I got to talk to Akmal, who I love. He's real cool. He's really nice as well. Uh, I, th I really pissed him off though. I said, uh, I said, oh, hey man, I've, I'm like, I've been such a big fan of you. I've been a fan of you for like, uh, 
for years, I, I, I remember listening to your radio show in high school and he goes, fuck you, bro. <laughs> he just made him feel really old. <laughs> uh, but he was really cool. He was real lovely. And he was uh, very well spoken on the show. And I actually... um. Didn't notice at the time, but when when I was speaking, they cut to him a few times, and he and he was like nodding his head, like "fuck yeah." So I thought that was really, really, really cool because I because I could totally Im- imagine seeing like older comics seeing what's happening with younger comedians being very, <laughs> very anti uh, offensive or anti dark stuff, and I could just see you thinking like, "ah oh, fuck, they're gonna ruin it." Mm-hmm. So I feel like if I were an older comic and I saw young people like flying the flag of, no, nah, I think you can joke about anything as long as your intentions are good. I'd be like, fuck yeah, too. Because I am like that. Like not many, so, there's hardly any like good comics out there. Uh, I should just end that sentence there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in Australia. No, but there's, there's not too many people like my age and younger that are like, yeah, I reckon we can joke about anything if it's good enough. Um so yeah, that was it was very it was very interesting. The the funniest thing about it all was like how many like calls I got from every person over 50 in my life. <laughs> like everyone, like my mom, my dad, my grandma, uh and then and then all of them told me that all of their friends were like blowing up their phones going, "Your yeah. son's on TV, your grandson's on SBS, he's made it." Yeah, I reckon that would have been the highest rated episode ever. Man, it, it it's like I feel like the on the on demand version maybe. I don't know if any of my people watched it on actual TV, but mm. definitely app numbers probably I, I guess would have been higher. Yeah. Cause my fans were like very excited about it and people who listen to the show were like super stoked. Uh and what what, what was really cool, because this is what I've been like I've been so confused about why media hasn't engaged with the online entertainers, like not just me, but like everyone in Australia. There's like so many brilliant comedians from different walks of life that have giant online platforms. Always confused me why mainstream media never engaged with us. Uh, Because like I go on SBS Insights Facebook page and I look at the two posts that they put up with me from that episode. They've got like... 50,000 views and thousands of comments and uh, thousands of likes and hundreds of comments. And then you look at the next two posts from the same episode with different people. And it's not a knock to these people because they're very talented, but they don't have any engagement at all, really. Like, uh, so to me, it's, it just seems like shooting yourself in the foot. It's like, if you have someone who's good and has an online audience, it's free press. It's like uh, free engagement. It's, it's, it's a good mutually beneficial thing for for the media because they get a bunch of new eyeballs on their shit and then also for me because I get legitimized and I get like I get a whole brand new audience that's never heard of me before and you know maybe if those that audience lives uh long enough like I'm talking over the next like month or so they'll be able to see me live at the comedy festival <laughs> bluespears.com come see me grandma um so yeah, that was fun, and I, I think it was it was cool to do, and I, I hope I can do more things like that. Basically, I think I did I think I did well, and the producers were really happy with me. So maybe more things will happen. Maybe maybe I, I you know that they have like a big list. I've seen it in radio actually. The people behind the scenes have like a big list of like people from demographic who were good and who yeah. were bad. They do literally have these lists. So like if they ever need to speak to like a lady in their 50s, they open up their big list and they've got like they've got they got them in like categories like right wing shock jock, left wing whatever, cool mum and they just have these <laughs> lists and they go through them and they go, oh, "Let's see who's free. Let's call uh, this chick." Um so yeah, that was good. Uh the only thing that I was unhappy about was they cut one of my jokes, uh which I I did say on Luke and Lewis, uh but uh, they cut one of my jokes that, that I thought was very funny. Yet. Oh, it's not out yet. This oh, man. comes out first. Spearhead Sunday is exclusive, all right? So <laughs> those, those fucking dorks over at Luke and Lewis, we're, we've got the scoop on them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we're talking about, like, comedy evolving and uh, and the idea of, of, uh, of like, cancel culture and, and, and the line and what's too far and what's not. And I brought up the fact that we don't do blackface anymore. Well, I don't. Right, uh, I brought up the fact that you know it's it's like everyone kind of assume, uh, everyone kind of agreed. Comedians, audiences, entertainers, everyone agreed that blackface is a bad thing because it comes from an inherently racist place. It's like it might have been also funny to some people, but the the intention of it was racism. It was the intention of it wasn't to make people laugh. The intention of it was 
to make, uh, you know, black people be seen as lesser, to feel lesser, to hurt them, right? So we all kind of agreed we're not going to do that anymore because it's, you know, for the most part, a bad thing, right? And I talked about that. Uh, and I said, basically, I said, basically that I said, oh, you know, it's, it's changed. It used to be incredibly popular. It was one of the most popular forms of entertainment in the world, minstrel shows. Uh, and then we agreed, uh, that it was bad. And then I said this, which they cut. Uh, and now today blackface is something that only a very small minority of ABC executives would fund. And the entire crew burst out laughing. <laughs> the people behind the camera, because if you don't know, a SBS and ABC—they're both government funded. They're, they're, you know, they're kind of the same thing almost. They just have different mission statements. ABC is like the government funded broadcaster. SBS is like the government funded multicultural broadcaster. Uh, so it's very similar. They share departments, and I say that. And the entire crew burst out laughing and even the host who really is there to not react and to be very unbiased uh, because the ABC has a very long history of, of very long and very recent history of like funding stuff with blackface in it, which, you know, I, I, I'm not out there to like cancel them for it, but I just thought it was like a funny joke. Uh, to slip in there and they cut it out probably for good reason you know I feel like uh, the the bosses over at ABC were like well we told you guys to stop bringing that up <laughs> we don't work with Chris Lilly anymore what do you want us to do he's on Netflix we lost him fuck um so yeah that was that was cool um that was like only 10 years ago yeah it was, it was very I recent about that it was very very recent shut up Siri um it was a very recent thing, and that's uh, so that's why I said that, and they cut that. That was the only thing I was unhappy about them cutting, but I also totally understand why. <laughs> they probably didn't want to get in trouble. Um, so, yeah, but now I've put it out there, I'm happy. Uh, then then afterwards, I um, uh, went, went to a gig with, uh, af after, like, talking about, like, maybe disagreeing with, with a few of the comics about what the line is, a bunch of us went to a gig straight after the show and and hey maybe maybe I'm in the wrong here but I just pulled out all the stops and I just did m m all of my most fucked <laughs> material like, I'm like what did these comedians say you couldn't joke about and I went through the list and I'm like yep 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 and I just like, put up put together this like fucked set and did it all and demolished it was like <laughs> See, I think you can do it. <laughs> so, yeah, that was great. Um, and uh, that was fun. Thank you very much to everyone who, like, watched it and, and uh, gave me their thoughts. Pretty cool stuff. I hope I can do more of it. Um, what else is happening? How long have we been going here for? Can I have that so I can... Yes, hold? you may. Um, uh, we've been going for... 28 minutes. Okay, great. Guys, this episode is sponsored by Manscaped.com. Use code SPEARS for 20% off and free shipping your first order. Uh, from uh, they, they, Manscaped.com makes such brilliant products such as the Lawn Mower 4.0, the best ball bag trimmer in the game. All right, something that I use regularly. If you look at that SPS Insight, I've got a very, uh, I've got a very hairy neck beard and that's because I didn't use the trimmer. And yes, I use it on my balls, my taint, and my face. All right? Sue me. You know? Absolutely. Um, it's a multitasking machine, and I will use it as such. I don't know if that's recommended. Probably not. I, I do it in the shower, right? So everything's clean. I hope that makes a difference. But still, manscaped.com. Use code SPEARS for 20% off and free shipping. The Lawn Mower 4.0. Right. Uh, they also have a bunch of like body wash uh, and two in one shampoo and conditioner. What's funny about that? What's funny about two in one <laughs> shampoo and is conditioner? Funny about two in one shampoo. Sometimes a lot of men out there are in a rush when they're having a shower. <laughs> yeah. You know, we've all been there. Oh, I have to have I have to have a really quick shower. I don't have time to use two products. Well, you'd be glad that it's not three in one. What else could they chuck in there? Body wash. Oh, body wash. There's a, there are body wash, like three in ones. Well, that's a bit much. Four in ones, I think, also exist, like face wash as well. What about five in one toothpaste? <laughs> 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 like, yeah, you just you wash your hair, you condition your hair, you body wash, and then you brush your teeth with it. That shit, I bet, would like pop off in sales twenty years after it comes out. It finds out it you know, everyone finds out it had lead in it, yeah. or something like. Oh man, why are my teeth falling out? I've got cancer. What's going on? <laughs> Uh, but that's not what Manscaped sells at all. I don't know why I brought it up. Manscaped.com products are great. They have their own body wash. 
All right, they don't do three in one. They've got a one in one body wash, uh, and uh, <laughs> there's nothing funny about that. Their uh, their deodorant is actually sick. It smells really nice. I've been wearing it. Uh, it smells really good. Uh, so manscaped.com, use code Spears for twenty percent off and free shipping. What a bargain! Um, <laughs> Yeah, anyway, so uh, a little update on uh, the Friendly Geordie situation. Uh, Quick recap, Um, Christo, who is is, uh, Friendly Geordie's Keelan, uh, his producer, uh, got arrested after he approached John Barillaro, former uh, politician in the street, to ask him about a lawsuit that he had filed against Friendly Geordie's. Now, I know it might be fucking shocking for you to think, but they are journalists, you know. Even if they're funny, that doesn't mean they're not journalists, right? And they're on YouTube and they make silly fucking jokes and wear wigs. Doesn't mean what they do isn't journalism. You might not like it. You might not think they're correct all the time. But I will say this. Since when did being correct become a prerequisite to be a journalist, all right? When's the last time you read something and you were like, oh, that's true, Hmm. Herald Sun? Oh, wow. I, I, I've i read that. And that you know what? That's actually true. Great. Thank you so much, Daily Mail. Obviously, truth is not uh, a part of journalism anymore. It's time to accept it. And I think it's a, a, a really bad indictment on the state of journalism that most of y- young people in the country trust an autistic guy screaming in a wig doing Marge Simpson impressions more than they do the actual fucking media. Maybe you should have a look at yourselves, journalists who don't like friendly Geordies if you're upset with him. Anyway, little update. Um, uh, Christo Lanka approached John Barillaro while he was uh, uh, in public, right, and asked him about a lawsuit that was filed against his boss. Now, this is something that journalists do all the time. If you're a politician, you're a public figure. Uh, this is something that you should expect. He wasn't violent. He didn't get too close to him. He wasn't yelling. He wasn't threatening. He was literally just, hey, John, hey, John, hey, John, what's going with this? Ask the question a few times in a row. John gets in his car, drives away. Uh, after that, very shortly after that, the uh, secret police, plainclothes police officers, rock up at Christo's house, uh, kick his dog, push his mum over, and arrest him in his front lawn and uh, charge him, uh, I think, I can't remember what he was charged with, but it was like uh, stalking or, I don't know, it was like it was like some crazy charge from an anti-terror police unit. Like, these are people that uh, you can't call them. Like, I couldn't call them and report terrorism. They're like, secret department of the police that are specifically out there to catch like their mission statement is to catch like lone actors that might kill politicians right so they're out there to catch terrorists uh but instead john barillaro it appears my new favorite word it appears it would seem uh allegedly called them and sent them over to this fucking kid's house some youtuber's house to get him arrested for asking him a normal question about his behavior in the courts Why are you suing someone? Totally normal thing that any politician should expect and something they should that should be encouraged. If you're a politician, you should be up for scrutiny. That's the fucking job. You know? So many politicians get in and they think they want to be like, oh, I'm a fucking I'm an MP. I'm a cool politician. I can do whatever I want. It's like, no, you're here for us to say, hey, you're doing a shit job, do a better one. That's what a politician is. And if we keep doing that and you keep listening to us, the country gets better. That's what it is. You're not going to be there as, as some fucking like martyr that everybody loves or some that people follow. Those cunts are crazy. You might see them at the polling booth. They're nuts. They tried to try uh, charge him with four counts of stalking or intimidating Mr. Barillaro with intent to cause fear or physical harm. Wow. <laughs> he asked a question. Yeah. It's and and to be fair, I guess well to to the cops. That wasn't the first time that Christo had come in contact or the Friendly Geordie's team had con- come in contact with John in person. But but that's what journalism is. Like, journalists and reporters will have multiple encounters with politicians or famous people doing their jobs, and as long as they're not out of line or touching them or threatening them or, or hurting them, then that's, that's the fucking deal, all right? Just because it's on YouTube and you don't understand it because you're a boomer and you don't like what they're fucking saying on there doesn't mean that you're exempt from it. So anyway, Christo gets charged with all those, or they, they try to charge him with all of those, all of those uh, really terrible crimes. Like if he was committed, that's like years prison. Like if he, if, he, if he loses that case, he goes away for a long time. But the great update is today, right, uh, after Friendly Geordie's raised a million dollars for the legal defense fund for Christo's case and the defamation case, 
uh, that was recently settled in Jordan's favour, uh, Christo got out. They dropped all charges. The police, he didn't even win the case. The police dropped the case. They gave up, right? The court ordered the police to pay $12,000 in costs. Yes. So not only did they drop the case, they also had to pay all of Christo's legal fees. That, I don't know if that's all of them, but that's a significant chunk of his legal fees, which is just such justice. I love to see it. Like I was, And honestly, a little bit surprised to see it. I think it's really, really great uh, and real surprising move from these cops to drop the case because they were doing everything they could to uh, fight and win this case. They tried to, to, to pass a suppression order to stop Friendly Geordies from talking about the case on his YouTube channel. Uh, they tried pulling up evidence of, of unrelated things. They tried charging him with extra counts of shit. They tried everything and it really, really strikes me as like dirty cop behavior uh, that like, it strikes me as like they were uh, going under John Barillaro's command. Like it really feels like John called them and they did his bidding because John was a very, very powerful man at the time. And I don't think it's a coincidence that they dropped the case only a few months after John Barillaro resigned, you know, he resigned from his position and then a couple months later, the cops dropped the case. Maybe, perhaps, because winning the case wouldn't benefit them as much as it would if they won it while John was in power. You know? Maybe the people running that unit were a little bit buddy-buddy with John, a very powerful man at the time. And maybe if they locked up one of his biggest criticizers, they would get a nice little gift or a nice little promotion or a nice little pat on the back from an incredibly powerful man. But when that incredibly powerful man resigns, gives up his office, and goes back to being a private meatball, what's the benefit of winning the case other than not looking like an idiot or not looking like you did the wrong thing? Not really any benefit there, so maybe that's why they dropped it. it, it, it that's what it appears to be to me. That's my opinion. Can you hear that, Keelan? That's the cops knocking at my fucking door. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I just I think it's such a, a such an amazing thing that they won the case, and it's a it's a great you know great thing for free speech and uh, the ability to criticize politicians. It's a real scary moment where you know politicians are throwing out lawsuits left and right, and then which is one thing that's a pretty scary thing, but you know that's kind of just like rich cunt behavior where if you have enough money, you can sue people who can't defend themselves because they don't have money. It's a entirely different subject when the actual law is seemingly doing these politicians bidding and locking up dissenters. That's like actual dystopian shit. So I watched uh, Jordan's video on it and uh, he, he chucked in a little nugget saying that he suspects they may have withdrawn the case because uh, his legal team was subpoenaing information that maybe they didn't want out there. Oh. So, you know, maybe they were oh, subpoenaing, nice. did the police do this because they thought Christo was actually a threat or did they do this because maybe a certain meatball gave them a call? Like why, where, where did the decision to do this actually originate from? And if that was subpoenaed and that landed on my desk and I saw that and then I would have to go, well, fuck, if I, you know... If I have to give give them the access to this information, they're going to find out that maybe processes weren't followed. That's going to look pretty corrupt. I'm going to withdraw the case. Maybe that's what happened. So congratulations to Friendly Geordies uh, and their whole team. I think that's a really great win uh, for free speech, and I'm very happy to see it. Really cool stuff. Um, uh, what else do we have here? The Ukraine stuff is still going. Love to see it. Um, lo love to see that Ukraine hasn't fallen. Basically, it's uh, it's kind. Of, I feel like what I said in the last episode seems to be happening, where it's like this just seems to be so much more difficult than Russia thought it was going to be, uh, and maybe poor planning on their part. Although the big update is, I said last time that they were sanctioning everything other than oil imports. U.S. and U.K. are no longer importing importing Russian oil, so. Uh, to all the people who've been making fun of me for uh, having no license. Keelan, do you know what the price of petrol is? $2.25. Right. And do you know it's going to go up? 
Yes. Right. Did you know that I didn't even know that it was $2.25? Did you know that you're no longer getting lifts into Richmond anymore? What? (laughs) That's bullshit. Give me back those tiny teddies. (laughs) We're going to have to catch the train in together. Yeah, let's do that. That sucks. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to get way more expensive too. Oh, uh, it's yeah, unbelievable. They uh, yeah, they can't they can't do the they're not ex, they're not importing Russian oil, which I suppose is a good thing. I guess I don't know. It's I've seen I've been seeing a lot of like uh, counterpoints to is this actually a good idea? And and it's like what's interesting is a lot of people are like oh sanctions are good because even if it does hurt Russian people like the regular Russian people, because then they will realize that Putin is a bad leader and maybe they'll want the system to change. But what actually seems to be happening is, and and I think this makes sense, is Russians just going, oh, these other countries are evil and they're trying to destroy us. They're trying to hurt us, you know? Like, which I think, which I think is totally, like, uh, understandable. Like, I, I could see that happening here. Like, if China put crazy sanctions on us... Mm. I wouldn't, you know, I don't think a lot of people's who, especially like, it's not like Russia is like very educated on geopolitics. You know, they're living under like uh, a dictator, basically, who restricts free speech and freedom of expression and thought and journalism. So it's not like these people are super educated on the war or geopolitics or why this could be happening or even the state of their own country. So if bad things just start happening and then every single media outlet and source you see starts going, oh, America and the West are trying to destroy us, you'd probably just believe it. You'd be like, oh, yeah, well, fuck those guys, and it would make you stand with your home country and your your fellow you know, neighbours more. So maybe the sanctions aren't a good idea, or maybe they are because it will just it will force Russia to run out of money, and then maybe they'll go, oh, well, fuck. We can't afford to do this anymore. Let's pull out. But I guess that all depends on how long Ukraine can hold out. Mm. I think it's, this is very uneducated of me to say, but I think it's very unfair of them to, uh, like shutting down the Coca-Cola factory in McDonald's. Mm. That just affects the everyday person. I don't really understand why they're affecting. Like well, that, that affects like poor people. Well, yeah. But here's the thing. Those companies are making a big show about shutting down and going, we're shutting down mm. because we don't support Russia's actions. That's not the real reason they're shutting down. They're shutting down because they can't get their ingredients into Russia. So they no, those was, businesses can't operate anyway. There was a, a, an open letter written by some some guy yeah. and it listed every company in, in Russia that was American-owned and went, you guys haven't shut down, why? And uh, three days after right. he submitted this letter to wherever it was... All these companies, Gucci, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, they all were like, okay, we're suspending business. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't think a letter makes them do that. I don't know. I'm I'm I might be wrong. One of us oh, is one of us is it's prob- probably yeah. a bit of both. Yeah. I would think. Like I would I would imagine if because I mean fuck, they shut down the Swift banking system. Mm. So so like all of the McDonald's and all of the American businesses in Russia couldn't send money back. There's still McDonald's. I know are still paying all their employees even while they're shut down, so that that's good. Their lives aren't affected, but yeah. that's a good point. How are they going to be they're getting be any money? Paying them in in rubles that are that are becoming more and more worthless. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I I, I I guess that maybe I'm being too cynical, but I feel like you know Gucci shutting down has less to do with a moral standpoint and more to do with like oh well we can't really send our like slaughtered animal fur mm. there because it's too hard because all of the shipping containers are backed up because of all this bullshit, I guess. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Sound off in the comments below. Tell me. What do you think? Also might be a mistake shutting down Coca-Cola and Maccas because all, all the citizens are going to become healthy. Well, yeah, I feel like it, that's a, <laughs> is that a loss? You know, it might be like a short-term loss, but not having access to Coke and Big Macs is a great thing. It's like, well, now we're helping them. Now yeah. we're going to help them become a real superpower. That's actually the first thing I thought. Yeah. It's like there's not going to be any fatties in Russia anymore. No. Not that there is. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I can't think of a fat Russian that lives in Russia, actually. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think <laughs> I, I, what is crazy about it is seeing all of the, again, right, all of the footage coming out of of Ukraine from both sides. And it's just like, uh, what did you say the other day? Cracks my back. 
It really hurt. I, I said that the this is like the first war uh, fought by people who grew up playing Call of Duty. <laughs> Yeah. In Call of Duty lobbies and live yeah. chats. And it, and it's not so much the, like, I'm not seeing anyone, like, slide cancelling out there. You know, I'm not seeing anyone, like, uh, akimbo jewel wielding, like, two SMGs. <laughs> but I am seeing heaps of behaviour that is very <laughs> reminiscent of a lobby. You know? Like, like no cunts run, rolling around with no guns and, and like, a, like a no footstep rollout just with throwing knives. Mm. And no, no one's doing quick scope. 360 jump off a crane headshots anymore screaming uh, mother get the camera you're not seeing that <laughs> but you're seeing a fuckload of trash talk uh just happening both ways like i saw one great video of uh of a of a of a ukrainian right standing on top of a tank that a russian tank with russians inside yeah. just knocking on the roof going come out Come on, come out, you disgusting Russian pig dogs. That's so dangerous. But he was saying it in German, which is so Call of Duty lobby to have some guy who's not speaking the, the language that everyone else <laughs> is just just throwing out like racist insults yeah, yeah. in a foreign language. That's awesome. I love that. Really great. And, and in the video, he's like stomping on the roof of the tank and in one hand he's holding his phone in the other hand, he's holding a fucking grenade, <laughs> which is so crazy to see that some guy's just like, oh, this will go viral, me dropping a fucking grenade into a tank. That's awesome. The, crazy. The, the one video I saw that made me think of this, it's like a transcript of all, all these guys talking and they're yeah. just dropping the F slur and saying like, I'm going to cut your dick off and give it to your mother Yeah. in whatever language. And they're speak. talking to Russians. To, to Russians. Right. I don't know if this is real. This could be, this could be fake, but it yeah. sounded really real. And I saw another video of some- Well, that means it's real. <laughs> some Ukrainian guy shooting with an RPG just in the middle of the street. Yeah, that was- Fucking That's real COD behavior. Yeah, I've seen two videos like that of like a guy walking out. And what's I don't know why it's shocking to me, but in, in my head, right, if I'm going out to go kill a tank and I've got a rocket, I would like sprint out and then shoot it straight away. Yeah. These Ukrainian soldiers are like strolling. It's like they've it's like they've just like taken their grandma for a walk on Sunday. They're just slowly walking down the street, setting up with an RPG. And then, like taking like like three seconds to aim it properly, and then shooting it, and then the tank explodes, and then they just stroll away. Yeah, I'm like, man, maybe maybe war is like a uh, a lot less deadly than I thought. Because I feel like if I'm a Russian and I see a guy walking down the street with a fucking RPG, I'd be like, get that guy. That I yeah, it seems like they're having a lot of fun. Yeah, seems like they've just gone out with the boys. You're right. This is a good thing. <laughs> You know, the world was getting a little bit boring. We've been staying inside for too long. Let's start shooting rockets in the street. Mm. Undeniably fucking cool. <laughs> yeah. As horrible as it all is, you know that guy every night is like, yeah, but fuck, how sick was that? <laughs> and it was on film. Mm. You know, you talk about all these like World War II soldiers. Oh, I did this, I did this. Did your grandpa? You know, like I bet, a, I bet a bunch of their kids are going, oh, yeah, sure you did. Sure you took down fucking five German planes. Oh, look out, it's the ghost of France. <laughs> right? But if, if you had your grandpa and the whole war, he had a fucking GoPro taped to his head live streaming it to TikTok, he could, he could go, check out this. This is what I took out, like six Russians with a grenade. I dropped it in a tank. Would I was cool. speaking German the whole time to freak him out. <laughs> would be cool to be on the front lines and be wearing a GoPro. Well, there's a lot of people like that just yeah. doing that. It's uh, it's nuts. You can see that of like, you know, that's happening like in the Middle East, uh, like the Afghanistan war. There's heaps of footage of like Australian troops under fire with GoPros on their head and stuff. It's crazy. It's crazy to see, but I guess this one's even wilder because it is just like regular people that are caught up in it that have phones. Uh, so they're doing that. So, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. Uh, wild times. I, ho I hope. Uh, I hope. I don't know. I hope Ukraine holds out, or I hope. I hope it's just solved at some point. Um, I was thinking about this the other day. What What happens when Putin dies? Because I was shocked to find out that he's almost seventy. So he he dies in our lifetime. I wonder if it gets better or worse. Because I was thinking about this. Uh, Hitler dies, right? 
I reckon it continues on as planned because it seemed like he had a lot of great buddies. You know, Goebbels. Yeah. He had uh, Goering. He had a lot of guys around him that were like, yeah, we, we understand the mission and we believe in it. I look at Putin and it seems like no one around him understands the mission. They just do as they're told because if they don't, they'll be killed. It seems that way to me. Uh, whereas Hitler was like, here's my idea and here's where we're going to be in like a hundred years. And, and so that I feel like if he died, it could keep going. Whereas it definitely seems like a lot more secretive and controlled by fear than, than other, I guess, dictatorships that I'm familiar with. So I wonder if he dies, does someone take over and go, that guy was fucking crazy, wasn't he? He had us invading Ukraine. That was fucking nuts. All right, come home, boys. Let's uh, let's do something else. Hey, I was thinking about free market trade. What do you guys reckon? That guy was fucking <laughs> nuts, huh? I don't know. Or maybe it just gets even worse. And you know, it probably just, he dies and it just turns into infighting, and then Russia turns into like sixty different countries. I bet. We'll see. Um, all right. Time for a uh, miscellaneous bit at the end, my friends. Uh, before we get into that, this episode is, uh, this miscellaneous bit at the end is uh, brought to you by Patreon. We've had a, a bunch of banger Patreon episodes recently, some really good ones, uh, and the, the Discord and the Patreon is growing, so I would love for you guys to jump on board. Uh, making a lot of jokes here about Keelan getting, not being paid, but he is not being paid, so I uh, would love <laughs> to have budget to do that, uh, and the way that we're, we're going to do that is with patreon uh, and we really want to pick it up and we really want to grow it and it's uh is growing every day but we would love to kind of get it back to where it was because i think i was doing the podcast really well and then COVID happened and it fucked everything up and obviously uh things shrunk but i would love to get the patreon back there so if you were a former patreon i would love for you to come back and uh i i'm gonna try my hardest not to fuck it up this time uh we need your support it would be really really great because uh i think this show can be big i think it can be huge and uh uh, we just need a little bit of a uh, little bit of a helping hand. So if you can lend one, that would be awesome, and you get a bunch of benefits and bonus content. We're actually uh, the the episode that's up right now is a Q and A uh, with all of the patrons who have uh, submitted questions and answers. There's some sick questions in there, uh, and they're all from the people who directly support the show. Plus, there's the big backlog of patron only episodes. So yeah, help us out, uh, and you get a bunch of stuff. Patreon, loose beers, check it out. All right, We've got this. Uh, this email. All right. <clears throat> oh, you'll like this one, Keelan. Love it. I got fired because of the Wiggles. Oh, let's go. I haven't heard this one. Uh, I haven't read this one yet. Hey, Lewis, long time listener, first time email here. So I got fired for the first time the other day. Okay. I think it's pretty funny, but also fucked enough to share with your listeners. It all started two weeks ago when I bought tickets to go and see the Wiggles in Hobart for their reunion tour. Oh, fuck yeah. I'm so shattered I'm going to miss that. I... Uh, I'm going to Tassie while the Wiggles are on. An adults only Wiggles concert is so funny to me. I'm actually really bummed that I can't go. I'll FaceTime you. Fuck yeah. For one song. What? <laughs> Flash forward a week and I had to leave work early to go and see the show. All was good with the boss <laughs> no. and they didn't mind. Turned out I had the wrong day. It was actually the next day. So I called my boss and I went back to work. Now, I had to find someone to cover me for the next day. We're a small company, so I only had a few options. I asked everyone and only one person said yes, but they had to leave a bit before we closed. So I told my shift manager that my co-worker would have to close on their own, and they said all good. I then did my shift that night until the other person came and I left. The Wiggles were great, and we had a fun night. Uh, anyway, cut to a few days later when I got a call from the shift manager where he told me uh, he told me that due to my performance on the weekend, they had to let me go. That's also after I got up the morning after a show to go put a table back into the shop that was missed on clothes. I guess I wanted to ask you, is this is funny or fucked and whether you think it's fair at all? I, I lost my job because I saw the wiggles. <laughs> I would say that's fucked, but it's also uh, worth it. Definitely fucked for them to just fire you because you made a normal human error. Definitely awesome that you got fired because you had to go to the Wiggles. You know what? I guess, you know what the problem is? If Keelan was like, hey, man, I really need to take like a day off to go and see the Wiggles, I would be okay with that. I don't think that's normal <laughs> at all. I don't think that any employer 
would listen to someone go, oh, like an adult male, right? Unless they employ, like, you know, unless you're like Jeffrey Epstein employing toddlers, then it's like, oh, that makes oh, a little man. bit more sense. What? <laughs> no, no, nothing. You, you don't think kids like the Wiggles? <laughs> you don't think Jeffrey Epstein likes kids? Mm. That joke tracks, right? Yeah. <laughs> I just feel like a normal employer from a normal job, mm. right, a real job, would look at an adult male going, oh, man, I really just can't work today. I want to see the fucking wiggles. They would go, cool, see you later. Go and see the wiggles every day next week. <laughs> so definitely fucked, but definitely funny. And that's absolutely what his boss says when he comes, we got to fire this guy. He went to the fucking Wiggles instead of work. They definitely talk about that at home. I think that's pretty unfair. It's definitely unfair. Yeah. For sure. But it's, I don't know, that's, let's like, uh, I think I got fired from a bank because uh, they they didn't like that I, uh, they didn't like that I wouldn't, here's one thing I fucking hated when I worked <laughs> at the bank. Yeah. And I think this is why they fired me. And I, and I was also vindicated many years later. So at the, I worked at the bank customer service. So you're on computers and you have lots of systems. And they were like, your shift starts at 10 a.m. Your systems take about 15 minutes to turn on and log into. So you have to get here at 9.45 a.m., to start logging into your computer and getting ready to work so you can start your shift at 10. And I said, isn't setting up the work equipment and logging into the system work? And they're like, no, because you're not doing anything. I said, ah, I'm turning on the equipment that you own and operating it. That has a startup time. I'm working. And they were like, no, you're not. And I would refuse to rock up 45, 15 minutes early to my shift so that I could start work on time. Cause I'm like, well, no, me arriving at the time you want me here and sitting down at my desk, that's when my work starts. <clears throat> like that'd be like you getting here and not paying you at all. <laughs> oh yeah. That's it. Yeah, that would no, but in your other job <laughs> where you do get paid, <laughs> yeah, that'd get be paid like, for. oh, you know, all the time you spent setting up the cameras and the lights, you're not getting paid for that because you don't actually start working until we hit record. Mm. That's bullshit. I always hated that. And guess what happened a few years later? Giant fair work lawsuit that sued a bunch of companies that were all doing that. Oh, all cool. of these customer service and IT and anything that had a computer system, they were all doing that and they all got sued fucking millions and now they don't do it anymore. Really great stuff. Finally vindicated. I was still fired, but still. How long have we been going here for? 58 minutes. 58 minutes. All right, it's time to wrap it up, guys. Uh, Hope you enjoyed this episode of Speared Sundays. Thank you very much for listening. Join the Patreon. We're doing a much better job at running it. We're doing a much better job in the Discord. If you have uh, been a former Patreon supporter, please, dear God, come back. If you're new, I would love to have you there. There's a bunch of stuff. I'm going to continue recording uh, for the uh, Patreon exclusive episode, which will be up right now if you're listening to this on a Sunday. Uh, and also, if you listen to this on a Friday, that's because you're a Patreon supporter and we love you. All right. Thank you very much. Come see me live, lucespears.com. Check out the Patreon and I will talk to you guys next Sunday. I hope you have a shit one.